Tostele, today we'll cover China as the new center of power. Now, if you look at China, China during and after the Second World War was very poor. There were a whole lot of unemployment, extreme poverty, and China also was facing worst economic exploitation. But then China became People's Republic of China in 1949, which was based on communist ideology. All right. But then in order to develop the country, it joined its hands with capitalist countries later. So uh, since 1978, China's economy has risen at a very fast rate. And this economic success since 1978 has been linked to its rise as a great power. Now, if you look at China these days, China is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And it is also projected to overtake the United States by 2040. So let's look at the rise of the Chinese economy under three leaders. We've got Mao, Tu Inlai and Deng Xiaoping, which we'll do in detail. China's economy under Mao was based on Soviet model or the socialist model. Now, Mao was the first leader of People's Republic of China after the Communist Revolution in 1949. And he was a firm believer of communist ideology and uh, the socialist model. So therefore, uh, following this model, China cut all its links with capitalist countries and they fully relied on Soviet and its own resources. This model also focused on creation of state-controlled heavy industries. And in order to set up these state-controlled heavy industries, they uh, fund the money that they would receive from agriculture. Uh, since China at that time was facing shortage of foreign exchange in order to buy technology and certain goods. So they substituted these imports by domestic goods. Okay, so this model actually allowed China to establish the foundations for an industrial economy. Uh, China at that time was also ahead of many developing states. The economy growth rate was 5 to 6%. But then there were problems. Although the economy growth rate was 5 to 6 percent, but then there was also an annual growth of 2 to 3 percent in the population. Now, this meant that the economic growth was insufficient to meet the needs of this growing population. Whatever was produced was consumed by the people. So, therefore, agriculture did not provide surplus for the industry. And on top of that, the industrial production was also not growing fast enough. The international trade was also very uh, minimal. And of course, the per capita income was also low as well. So therefore, this led to severe economic crisis and China faced the same uh, problems that USSR faced. Realizing the problems, the Chinese government took certain major changes in 1970s. Um, now, they put an end to the political and economic isolation. And in 1972, they also established friendly relations with the United States, which was a major historic movement. And Tu Inlai, in 1973, also introduced four modernizations, uh, that is, uh, that are agriculture, industry, science and technology, and military. And then under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, the open door policy was introduced in 1978. Now, this policy aims to increase the production with the help of technology and uh, capital from overseas. So basically, open door policy means open trade with other countries or the Western countries. Now, in terms of economic reforms, China didn't go uh, for shock therapy as the USSR did. In fact, they went for the step-by-step -step approach. First, in 1982, agriculture was privatized. Now, with the privatization of agriculture, it led to a competition amongst the individuals. And this ultimately led to a remarkable increase in agricultural production and the rural income. People had more money. They had more savings in their hands. And then later in 1998, industry was also privatized. So, uh, since people, the rural uh, income has increased, since with the increase in the income uh, of the rural people, it led to a growth in rural industry. So therefore, you know, industry as well as agriculture, they grew at a faster rate. 
and then they also introduce the special economic zones. Now, this special economic zones are the areas where trade barriers are removed, where foreign investors can set up their enterprises. All right, and this uh, in special economic zones, the foreign and domestic trade and investment are conducted without the authorization of the Chinese central government in Beijing. So this led to a huge rise in foreign trade. This also uh, became one of the most important centers for FTI because uh, labor is very cheap in China. So it, it, tra it attracted a whole lot of investors and it also led to a huge increase in foreign exchange and that now allows it to make big investments in other countries. And now if we talk about the strengths of China, then we can talk from these following points, which we will be doing in detail one by one, okay? Now the first reason for China to become the future possible world superpower is its population. China has got the largest population in the world. And as of 2017, if you look at the pie chart over here, China has 18.5% of the world's population followed by India. Second, in terms of area, China is the fourth largest in the whole world. And besides other natural resources, China also has a huge potential in hydropower. China also is the source of drinking water for so many countries. Now, from the economics perspective, China has been the fastest growing economy for decades. China became a membership of WTO in 2001, and this membership has boosted its economy. It is also projected that China will become the largest economy by 2040. That's what is mentioned in your test book. However, if you look at the chart provided over here, it is projected that China will become the largest economy by 2030. Okay, and as of 2017 um, census, if you look in the chart over here, China has got the highest GDP. It is also uh, the largest exporter as well as it is the second largest importer so that makes china a very powerful nation now in terms of arms and military china is developing advanced weapons at a rapid pace they're also spending a huge amount of money on military so if you look over here uh, in the ranking the world's most powerful militaries as per 2019, China is at the third ranking. And as per the 2019 ranking of the countries holding the world's nuclear arsenal, China is at the fourth position. And as per the 2019 ranking of the largest militaries in the world, you can see over here China stands first. Now all these points, all these factors uh, makes China a very strong contender to become the uh, superpower in the world. Now, China has its drawbacks and weaknesses. Although China has improved at a dramatic pace, unemployment problem is still there. 100 million people are still looking for jobs. The work condition over there is really poor. Female unemployment is still prevalent out there. Corruption has increased and is a major problem. Environmental degradation has also increased and is also a big problem. There's also a huge increase in gap between the rural and urban and coastal and inland provinces. And also, China has a very bad record of human rights violation. People in China do not enjoy certain basic freedom, such as freedom of expression. So, because of this reason, uh, China is not really an attractive place for, inter uh, for foreign intellectuals. And one of the major reasons could be the COVID-19 pandemics. Now, this COVID-19 pandemics has shaken and in a way devastated the whole world. We're still living... Uh, with the problem right now. Now, many countries, they suspect that this coronavirus is a virus created by China in a lab to be used as a biological weapon. All right. We don't know how far that is true, but then the anger and the mysteries against the Chinese government might divert the economic investments and trade to other countries such as India. So this could be, uh, or this could this could pose as a great threat to the Chinese, uh, China's development. All right, so with this, we have come to the end of this topic. So until I meet you next time, take care, stay safe, and study hard. All right, bye-bye.